Hey guys, how's it going? Good, thanks. How are you doing? I am pretty good. Um, how is, are you guys in quarantine or are you working from home? How are things uh, on your end? Yeah, basically just in isolation. Oh, okay. How was that? Uh, how, how are you dealing with that? Uh, making the best of it as I can. <laughs> yeah, I think it's an opportunity. I've started doing like, uh, you know, those insanity workouts, right? Plus you have a lot of time to learn. Yeah, I've been doing the, the P90X ones myself, to be honest. Yeah, I went to the, the to Walmart and all the weights are gone because <laughs> the gyms are closed, right? So I think they, they mass bought them. No, I was just thinking fun. I need to get myself some just so I can, you know, have some something else other than just, you know. I mean, they do say body weight's the best uh, equipment that you can have, but still. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, my friend started at 45 gym right before... Uh, he like he uh, started like uh, a branch of it yeah and then they had the shutdown so that hit him pretty hard right like, yeah right in that period of time so that kind of it's gonna be a little while at least at least six months but if not much more i think oh uh, you think so i'm in the states so i actually just moved to the states i don't know if you uh i mentioned that because that's why i stopped the the meetups for a bit right oh. With, uh, so last month right before the quarantine the week of the quarantine in the states when they, they locked everything down, mm -hmm. I had just moved here. And wow. then the second day I was here, I actually had to stay as a witness because this guy behind me got shot because they had an oh. argument. Yeah, so then the, the ambulance came and then he was like bleeding on. I was there, right? So I was at the gas station at the time. So then that rest of the day. And then by Thursday, that same week, it was quarantine. So that was my first time. That was my first week in the States. Wow. wow. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy, actually. Yeah, but it's nice. Yeah, but uh, I don't. I think it's a good opportunity if you are got, you are at home to like work out to like learn stuff and spend time with your family because like life is so busy these days that oftentimes people forget they don't have enough time to like to re get to know their family and spend that quality. Mm -hmm. time. Yeah, yeah, so, I'm appreciative of that right now. So, yeah, make the most of it. It's mm -hmm. Nice. Hey guys, welcome. I think this is probably going to be one of the more uh, busier, bus probably the busiest meetup uh, yet because uh, of quarantine. Because well, yeah, people. I'm not, I'm not actually in your area, so that's <laughs> so that's the only reason why I'm able to, to join up actually. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah I, I moved out of Toronto. Are you from Toronto originally? No, I went to school in Canada though, but you know, I'm just taking advantage of as much information as I can access right now. To be honest with you. Oh yeah. It's always good to learn, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, I will share my screen. Hmm. I wonder if I could automatically admit everybody. Hi, I'm, I'm excited to hack today. Oh, hi. Right. Well, it's not really hacking. It's more like introduction to tools. I was think I was trying to think about how to like uh, go about uh, doing this. Uh, okay. Later on, it might be more in detail. But um, I, if you haven't really dealt with this stuff before, it'll be something that you could take going forward. Okay. So okay. it is. It, it's it's something you'd use if you were trying to like uh, find security vulnerabilities and stuff. Um, web applications or desktop? Uh, well, actual applications, right? Okay. So this time it's not going to be web applications. Oh, okay, okay. Um, okay, so I guess we can start. So I will share my screen. Do you guys know if there's a way to automatically admit people into a meeting? Uh, um, you can edit the meeting itself to not have to allow um, the host to allow people in. It's a setting in there. If you go to the actual Zoom setup, the meeting setup, um, okay. you can just. Um, I think it, I think there's a there's an option that says something about along the lines of allow hosts to allow people access. It, it, it's it's something like that. I'm not sure of the exact wording. So just in case people join uh, a little bit late. Enable join before host. Edit this meeting. And let's 
six, I think. Okay. So let us get started. Sharing screen. Could you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay. So this group, um, you guys found it on Meetup, and I wanted to share what it's about before we get started. So the purpose of this group and what I'm trying to do is create a knowledge sharing and enhancement avenue for people interested in technologies through hands-on follow-along exercises and tutorship in anything technical, like hardware, software, security, et cetera, or anything cool. So if you found a new way to do things that is faster or uh, have delved into something interesting and want to share it, uh, feel free to host a session because I'm interested in learning new things, right? Uh, and I think everyone else is always keeps their ears open and that attracts people's interest when uh, you have the opportunity to learn about something um, with regards to your field of interest that uh, you didn't know about before. I also want to provide an avenue for networking amongst professionals and companies. Uh, later on, I'm hoping to hold live meetups, uh, probably when I return to Canada, um, in the Canada area, but I'll also be starting it in uh, the States um, after this quarantine ends. And uh, if you want to uh, give a presentation later on, uh, please uh, reach out. I'd be more than happy to, uh, to uh, set that up for you. Um, after this meetup, uh, I'm, I, have, I created a Google Forms. Please, if you're interested in more things like it, uh, please uh, add your information to it and I'll send out an email uh, whenever something is being planned. Okay, so who am I? Uh, I finished a degree in computer engineering over 15 years ago um, from the University of Ottawa. I've worked in digital hardware design. That was my first job, actually. Then I moved into web design databases, and I've gotten to see things change over the years. I've worked for big and small companies, and I've also gotten to work with uh, several languages, both professional and academic setting. Uh, these include VHDL, Assembly C, C Sharp, Java, PHP, WordPress, .NET Core, and more and I got a bunch of certifications. My uh, hobbies are lifting weights, traveling, movies, writing, and eating. Uh, I write books, so here are two books if you're interested in reading any of my stuff. Um, they're available on Amazon, and I also write uh, fan fiction. So that's enough about me. How about you guys introduce yourselves? Uh, I want this to be more like a, sort of uh, a discussion rather than a lecture. So feel free to speak up at any point during it. Um, but uh, how about we, there's 18 participants. So how about we all give like a, a, a 30 second blurb about ourselves. So um, who wants to start off? So here are some suggestions uh, you, for things you can talk about to introduce yourselves to the other people. So go on. Um, I guess I could start off. Okay. Um, okay, uh, my name is Harrison Rat, and I'm a student at uh, the University of Toronto. Um, I, I joined this um, uh, webinar just because I was uh, interested in uh, hacking experiments. Um, my favorite place in the GTA is, uh, is around the Queen's Park area because that's where my school is. Um, uh, some of the things that I'm interested in are um, Networking, um, uh, and networking, and uh, mostly like um, server server side stuff. I've experimented with um, hacking experiments I do around my school system. I was able to actually host a Minecraft server on my uh, school's uh, Linux computer, and I was actually able to uh, uh, forward the port using uh, ngrok. And ng rock and that was pretty cool and uh, i also found out that you can host a node.js website from there so i was pretty interested in that okay cool uh, are you studying web design uh no i'm i'm, I'm in engineering okay uh, what type of engineering electrical okay cool i i know a lot of electrical engineers after they read, graduated uh that made the transition to like uh, app development and stuff Okay, awesome. Okay. Cool. Uh, who, uh, that was nice uh, meeting you. Your, your name is Harish Harsimrat. Harsimrat. 
Okay, nice to meet you, Harris. From Matt. Does anyone want to go next and introduce themselves? A quick 30 second blurb about themselves. Anybody? Don't be shy. <laughs> okay, I can I hey, introduce myself? Okay, nice to meet you, Marcio. Uh, hello, yeah, my name is Marcio. Hi, I'm a security professional. I, I just came here to Canada to complete another postgraduate course at, in cybersecurity. So I just finished my course right now in, in April, and oh. I'm I'm here to to work in the field and to get more knowledge and and I I like this this meetup uh, for hacking because it's an interesting field so I can get more more knowledge so I can apply to my research and to learn more and more. Okay, so what types of things have you done with regards to uh, uh, cybersecurity or uh, hacking experiments, stuff like that? Yeah, I I participated um, two months ago in, uh, in my first CTF competition. Oh, those <laughs> things are to, rough. <laughs> yeah, it's very rough. <laughs> but it's good to have a, an experience in how everything works, so it's good. Okay. Uh, my previous job, I work in a security department in a bank, so that's why I, I'm here to gather more knowledge and just to to be up to date with all of the these new things that are happening right now. Oh, okay, that's cool. So if you know anything, that because I'm not, I'm by no means an expert because I don't work in this field, right? I'm just yeah, interested okay. in it. So feel free to throw in your two bits, right? Or even if you later think of some cool topics to give a presentation on, feel free to. Okay, all right. Uh, nice to meet you, uh, Marcio. Yeah, nice to meet you, too. Um, can, you can you hear me? Uh, hey, Ogindra. Uh, yeah, hi. Hey. So, you know, I'm a pure app developer, okay? This is something entirely new for me. And only to start knowing about this, the triggering point is two years back, one of my customer a website was hacked, so domain, it was a domain level hacking, right? Mm -hmm. I could not do, but it's give me the interest to understand how all this stuff is working. So okay. you can say I am fresher in this journey. Okay. okay, that's cool. We all know something other people don't. So if you uh, know about anything or have any questions or could contribute, feel free to. Yeah, but uh, I'm cool. expert in uh, Azure web website, right? And DevOps. Okay. And that's cool. There's always something new in the field. I found it's developed so fast, it's very hard to keep up with everything. Yeah. Okay. So nice. Uh, where where do you did you study, uh, Yogendra? And well, I did work? my studies in India actually. Oh, so okay. Not in the state uh, in India. So oh, okay, I've cool. done my masters and everything. Oh, okay. Awesome. Well, nice to meet you, Yogendra. Yep. Same here. Hey everyone. Um. Anyone want to go next? And introduce yourselves. Don't be shy. <laughs> How about you, Arvin? I saw you. Hey there. Uh... Oh, hi. I just joined in. Sorry. Hi, Neil. Uh -huh. My name is Arvin. Uh, I, I work for uh, Labla. I work as an application secure, uh, security architect. Okay. This is my first meeting with Niels. Oh, okay, that's cool. So you work in application security. So if you know anything or could contribute, <laughs> um, probably like I'll just kind of be a listener to first. And then like, uh, I'll kind of join it when I need it. Oh, okay, uh, nice to meet you, Arvin. Um, um, anybody else wanna go? Don't be shy. Speak up, it's a good opportunity to get to know other people and to introduce yourself. Um, who knows, you might meet up later, especially if you're interested in security. What I found about is that uh, longer, especially since I've worked a lot in the Toronto area, uh, that as I went to different meetups and stuff, and over the years, I would often meet people um, or my coworkers at the different meetups or people, um, I would start working with people from meetups, right? So it's always good to uh, get it out there. But if you're shy, don't feel pressured. Anybody? Can you hear me? Um, yep, uh, St. Like. Yeah, or it's St. Ike. Um... Good evening, everyone. I'm based now out of um, Caledon, 
uh, in the Toronto GTA. My background is in electronics uh, from Nigeria, um, business intelligence from the United States. I recently founded a company um, that's focused on the Internet of Things, providing end-to-end -end solutions uh, for industries and farms and small, uh, smart cities. So that's something we're basically beginning to work on from January uh, this year. I have no experience with um, cybersecurity or hacking, but I, I felt this was a good place to, to be because um, even in the, in the sphere of the Internet of Things, uh, we have to look into the security aspects to make sure that um, um, our products are adequately protected. So that's why I'm here. I'm hoping to learn from everyone and um, also network. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's pretty cool. Uh, do you have customers yet or have you just started? Oh, we just started in January, still setting up the business. Oh, okay. That's pretty cool. Are there any interesting projects you're working on in particular? Oh, well, basically um, what we're looking at right now is uh, predictive maintenance, being able, especially for um, industries with legacy machines, so equipment that are not currently connected to the internet because they are pretty old, 10 years, 20 years and, and more. Um, being able to connect those to the cloud and um, analyze them and predict uh, failures before they happen. Okay, I, that's, that'll save a lot of money because when things fail, uh, they often take down other stuff, so that's expensive, right? Correct. So. Okay, that's pretty cool. Nice to meet you, Saint Lake. Is Saint that your name? Saint Lake. Saint Lake. Saint Lake. Okay, nice to meet you, Saint Lake. Uh, any, anybody else want to introduce themselves? Yeah, can I introduce myself? Uh, sure, Sabine. Yeah, hi, my name is Sabine and I'm from Toronto and I am professional uh, CPA, right? And right now I'm working as a finance manager in one of the uh, baby food company. It's called Cabrita and our group is based in Netherlands and also our board set in China and Singapore, right? So my the interest of like uh, to introduce from the hacking is like, I just want to learn <clears throat> what it's all about. And uh, like in near future, like in six months or seven months, I will launch my own e-commerce platform from Canada. So I want to like, you know, learn <clears throat> how the technology works <clears throat> behind e-commerce business and how what is all about the hacking and stuff so I can like you know understand what are the security features we have to build for our uh, e-commerce platform oh, and um, yeah and it's like my hobbies are like currently in quarantine I'm focusing more on like you know learning uh, different uh, things through like online learning and my hobbies are like especially traveling right now not now, like after yeah. we will all have to <laughs> Exactly. Like, uh, and also like visiting new places, try different new things. Yeah, so most of uh, that is my takeaway right now. Okay, that's pretty cool. And plus, if you um, learn to program, uh, a lot mm -hmm. of that stuff could make your finance career uh, much yeah. easier, right? Yeah, because that's right. And everything yeah. interviews to everything. Yeah, and like for my new next interest will be like if you can introduce us a little bit of the database, that would be great because be last year, yeah, last year I learned uh, SQL when I was actually a beginner. So I like I was, <laughs> it was a little hard for me to, you know, learn, jump it into SQL. So, and also Tableau, I'm okay, but I want to like uh, um, more uh, built for near future for the SQL side and also oh, okay, that's cool. a bit of the data. Um, yeah. Why yeah. is that for analysis reasons? Like business exactly, intelligence? Exactly. You're, you are, yeah, that's very uh, right. Uh, and also like, you know, things are going to be changed from finance towards data analysis kind of thing. So I have to like, you know, upgrade myself and uh, be ready for the next role. Oh yeah, and machine learning and stuff and predictive analysis, that'll all be data, right? Because now- Exactly, you're you are all, right. You can do exactly. You can take hours or days. Oh, okay, cool, nice to that's, meet you, Sydney. That, that's very right, yeah, thank you so much. Um, and anyone else want to introduce themselves? Hi, 
Hi. <laughs> Is everyone else shy? It's a good opportunity to get to know people and get your name out there. No one? Hi. Um, well, I'll go. My name is Andrew. Um, I, uh, I'm currently employed as a, it's difficult to say what my position is, but it's, uh, it is related to security. But, uh, of course I haven't, uh, being previously a programmer, it's, uh, so it's, it's, it's a new experience for me, but I'm also on the lookout to see what the latest trends are and how to, defend yourself in those like currently uh, very uh, fast growing or fast paced security environment. So in the last few years, I've, you know, there's been a significant trend in, in how security threats have been realized and the, the consequences of it all. So I'm, I'm just here to kind of learn about that and uh, hopefully share some experiences with, with others in this group. Oh yeah, that would be awesome. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's changing so fast. Like, uh, have you used Kali Linux yet? Do you use that in your job? Uh, I have not, but I, I use, um, Ubuntu on one of my machines. So, um, okay. uh, not... like for a lot of pen testing stuff, it automates it, right? So, uh, what you would have to do manually one by one before, uh, there are tools well, that can do it. At well, least... On the job, I, I'm not doing the pen testing myself. Um, like I would contract that out, but I would like to get to a point where I can do that. Okay, cool. Uh, and anyone else want to introduce themselves? Nice to meet you, Andrew. It's been. A, uh, Thank you. I hope to hear more from you, especially as you get more into the field and you like have stuff to share. Feel free to reach out, or even if you're ready to give a presentation soon on what you've learned. Uh, you don't have to be an expert, right? Feel free to reach out. That would be awesome. I would love to hear about that stuff from any of you guys. Right. Um, anyone else interested in uh, speaking about themselves or want to introduce themselves? I can introduce, my, I can introduce myself. Can everybody hear me? Uh, yes, I hear you, Jesse. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I'm uh, an optimization manager at Torstar. Uh, so I spend a lot of my time doing like Python scripts for SEO and like JavaScript for A-B testing purposes. Uh, and on my side, I try to build little side projects with Node.js and React.js, which is why I was interested in this meetup. Uh, I've, wa I've watched like there's lots of YouTube videos on Node application security and stuff like that. But just in general, like Kali and security concerns I think are more important than ever before. So I found this particular meetup to be um, just an interesting topic and I wanted to attend. Oh, okay, that's pretty cool. Uh, so you do testing currently? Yeah, or... basically like kind of like front end JavaScript based A-B testing uh, programs. Oh, okay, that's pretty so cool. Like showing A versus B and then measuring the results, that kind of thing. Oh, okay. That's cool. So statistics and performance stuff, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, what are your interests and hobbies? And like, uh, uh, did you go to school in Canada? Uh, yeah, I actually went to school for journalism, but um, you know, okay. I've That's been around cool. the block a little while. So I've kind of done a couple laps and gone in different directions. And I ended up at the Toronto Star anyway, even though I'm not a journalist. So, but like my interests are really like, just improving Python application development, Node.js, React.js, maybe React Native. Uh, but like when you think about launching side projects like side hustles or, or um, indie hackers type experiments, security is like one of those kind of daunting things, right? Like if you launch something on the side that actually starts generating even like $20 revenue per month, like the, if you can't protect your users from from being exploited or, or your own application, then you're kind of in trouble from the start, right? Yeah, that's true. If people attack you, right? But usually from what I've seen, people don't pay, especially back in the day, security wasn't a concern until more recently, right? So yeah. a lot of the legacy applications and stuff were built without that in, in, uh, in, uh, in mind, right? So if you, if you overthink things, you're never going to get it done. So my yeah, suggestion would be to just go for it. 
and then worry about what you got to worry about later on. Uh, of yeah. course, know as much as you can ahead of time, but don't let it uh, uh, paralyze you from getting started and giving taking a shot at it. Right? Yeah, that's totally helpful advice. I'd also just throw out to anybody who is on LinkedIn, if, if anybody wants to connect with me there, um, you know, I'm a pretty open guy if people want to connect. So oh, anyway, okay, that's cool. Yeah, that's, add me. That's me. Add me, right? Like I'm on LinkedIn as well. Sounds good. I'm really happy to connect. Okay, I guess we'll get started. And the, anyone else that uh, wants to introduce them, themselves, uh, we could uh, talk, uh, have sort of a talk after uh, the lectures are gone through. Um, okay, so let's get started. Um, okay, so uh, before we get started, I wanted to mention some cool things to look into. Uh, Cybrary.it is a is a actual website that has um, free courses for learning about uh, cybersecurity. And uh, um, another cool concept that I saw uh, back in the day, this was like 10 years ago, there used to be a group called Hack Canada. Uh, I have a screenshot of their old website uh, on the right. So they would have things on it like little side projects like uh, about biohacking, or wetware hacking. I'm not sure if you guys have heard about wetware hacking. Have, has anyone heard about it before? Nobody? Let's do this more like a discussion, right? It'll be a more of a learning experience. So basically what wetware hacking is, is um, enhancing humans with technology. So there has been a lot of uh, um, progress in that lately. Oh, go on. Um, oh, sorry. So uh, basically um, on Hack Canada, right? There used to be a group of uh, Canadian people that were into technology um, who would uh, publish like uh, documents and uh, their research with regards to uh, biohacking or uh, uh, something called nootropics. I thought that was actually interesting. Uh, I, I heard that out of the side of my uh, year. So apparently these are like certain uh, drugs that enhance human cognitive ability. I don't know how useful they are because I haven't heard of any superhumans, right? But apparently it's supposed to um, make you learn faster and stuff like that, right? Um, and then the dark net, that's another cool thing to um, look into. So the dark net is basically uh, uh, anonymous internet where uh, a lot of websites that people don't usually visit are. So then there's weird things that go on on there, especially, um, but in order to access it, you need to use a, a browser named Tor. Uh, so it's like a hidden internet. So that's some cool things to look into. Um, so application hacking for beginners, let's get started. Uh, what we're gonna be learning about today are three things. We're gonna be learning about decompilers, hex editors, and do a couple of basic software uh, registration exercises. So these aren't that complicated. And uh, what I mean by that is a lot of times software has serial numbers or uh, certain um, requirements before you can get access to the full features. So we're gonna be doing a couple of simple exercises in order to uh, learn how to bypass that. In my eyes, these are eye openers. Um, they don't really teach you about these things in school, but uh, um, if you know about them, it, it just makes you understand things a little bit better. Um, but unfortunately, in order to understand this stuff, you're gonna have to understand a bit of coding uh, in order to actually use it. But uh, um, we'll have an introduction to coding meet up in the near future. Um, there are better teachers than me in the tech industry because there are people that actually specialize in it. I don't specialize in it. I'm currently a web developer. Um, and today I will be going into things like Kali, uh, Linux, and uh, the tools associated with it, like Kane Enable. Um, if you want to cut in and add in your two bits uh, for something you're aware of, uh, feel free to, because I don't know everything, right? So I'm more than interested in learning uh, easier ways because every day new tools come out and uh, oftentimes at different companies, people have different ways of implementing security because it's a rather new 
and uh, not that uh, um, heavily enforced uh, everywhere. So uh, yeah, so let's get started. Like Kali Linux and stuff will teach you about um, um, exploits that haven't discovered previously, but by having the ability to use these tools, you can find out undiscovered exploits and uh, in um, uh, programs and stuff that uh, um, you're dealing with. Is anyone familiar with what a decompiler is? Uh, feel free to speak up in case you've used it. Uh, uh, share what you've used it for and, uh, and what uh, tendency. Go on. So in general, right, when we make the application and uh, let's uh, take the example, I was a Visual Basic developer. Mm -hmm. And when I compile my application, it provides me EXC or DLL. But to know what exactly is the code, there was a decompiler that I can use and decompile that compiled form of the EXE or DLL. Okay, cool. So you'd use it in order to learn how programs work, right? Yes. You know, sometimes we have to do reverse engineering, right? When we get the application from some other vendor, the code is not there, the application team who developed, they are not there. And that's the only way to decompile the application and do the reverse engineering to understand the functionality. Okay, that's cool. Uh, and anyone else use the decompiler for a different reason? other than uh, uh, just learn how code works? For APK reverse engineering, we use uh, Dex2Jar and other decompiler softwares to kind okay. of reverse engineer the code, so. Okay, that's cool. And why do you do that? Sorry? I, and why do you do that in order? So in order to kind of identify the class files and see what kind of uh, algorithms are used and is there any kind of a hard coded password in it? In the application, which is which the developer by chance or by mistake like left it as a security misconfiguration issue. In order to find that, like we use the kind of decompiler uh, tools. Okay, cool. Okay, anyone else use it for a different reason other than that? Um, I used a decompiler to figure out uh, how a Java game was developed. Wanted to uh, find out how the actual source code for the game was. So I used an uh, online decompiler to uh, decompile the jar file, uh, the, the jar. Oh, okay, that's pretty cool. Okay, so how about hex editors? Has anyone used a hex editor before? Uh, hi, <clears throat> hi, Neil, and it's uh, Jesse again. I have, I have, I've used a hex editor before, but I also have a question about decompilers because I've, okay. I've read about them and, and like I know what they do, but I'm kind of curious, like how do you, how do you choose a decompiler? How do you like tackle a task like that? And I apologize, I don't know if you're going to go into this, but like for example. Is there a specific kind of like industry standard decompiler that would you, you would use for an Android application or an iOS application, or if you were trying to get insights about like a particular game, even like are there well known de game decompilers? And when you choose something like that, does it actually expose you to potential security risks yourself by using that software? Um, so with decompilers, they're specific to the language that the actual system was built in. Uh, so um, if you're dealing with the APK, usually you'd want to work with a uh, uh, APK de um, decompiler, right? Uh, if it's a program built in C++, uh, you'd want to use a C++ decompiler. Uh, but usually by looking at the code or even using an imperfect uh, decompiler, you could, or even looking at the description and stuff, you can sort of get clues as to what language um, the actual program was built in. So, um, but in order to use, to actually get something from a decompiler, you have to understand the language that the actual code was built in, right? Because if you don't, uh, then uh, you might end up a bit, uh, you, you're not gonna understand the code. You're not gonna uh, get anything out of it, right? Yeah, that makes sense. So would a hex editor be a tool that would you would use to look at the code and see if you recognize the patterns enough to choose a decompiler? Does that make uh, sense? Yes, so oftentimes the hex editor is basically the one. So uh, you know how data on a 
hard disk is uh, stored in ones and zeros, basically, like uh, uh, it's energy patterns, right? It's voltages. So um, the hex editor is like groupings of those numbers. So it's uh, so you can actually look at the code um, as it's stored on the drive. Does that make sense? We're going to actually look at that in a moment. Yeah, it does. Sorry. I usually have a lot of questions. I'm not meaning to like. Oh, no, no, this is great. This is great. This is great. Uh, questions are great. Right. Because as uh, when people ask questions, I learn things too, because it'll identify things I don't know. Right. Um, has anyone used a hex editor uh, for an interesting reason? Other than what we discussed yet so far? I think I'll jump in again. Uh, I used a hex editor to um, to figure out maybe string literals that are packed in a in a in in a, in a executable. Like, let's say you made a program and you wrote somewhere "Hello World," so usually you can find out with the hex editor that that literal inside that was compiled right into the binary. So oh, okay, cool. Okay. Uh, has anyone used it for uh, another reason other than to um, uh, look at string literals? I get the feeling hex editors aren't used as much uh, these days. But basically, you could see the code of the program as it's stored. Um, and another thing about that's cool about hex editors is that you can edit the actual program as it is, right? Okay, so let's uh, uh, continue. So decompilers, uh, they allow you to take an executable or APK and view the actual code uh, underlying it um, and see things happening in the application that are usually hidden from the viewer's eyes. So by doing that, um, as uh, I, I think it was uh, Arvin, who mentioned this, uh, I may have the name wrong. Uh, he used it to uh, look at the game uh, stuff. Uh, so uh, basically, you can reuse code of already built applications and learn how other applications uh, work. So rather than starting from scratch, you could start, you could uh, build something similar by looking at um, what's already there at other people's code. Because a lot of times people think that when you compile the code, it's uh, protected and no one will ever be able to understand what's going on, but that isn't necessarily true. As long as you have it on your hard disk, uh, chances are you will be able to get a better idea of how it works and be able to look into it in detail. Whether it's an executable, an APK, um, even uh, uh, your operating system files, you can uh, decompile them and look at them in more detail. Um, you can, if it, the decompiler works well and uh, properly decompiles the program fully, you can even modify the program and uh, have your own version of the program that you use going forward. Uh, but the, one of the issues with decompilers is that they don't always decompile perfectly, right? Uh, furthermore, you have to be familiar with the language it was written in. Because if you're not, you're not gonna really understand what was going on, right? Um, so um, we're gonna be looking at decompiling an APK. Uh, I, I believe, uh, I can't remember who did it. Uh, was it Norm? Or, um, uh, but someone uh, decompiled an APK before in order to look at the phone app information. Uh, Arvin, right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, so um, oftentimes with applications and stuff, what you'll find is that when you decompile the programs, that they're doing stuff that they didn't tell you about, right? So by doing this, you'll have more control over uh, uh, viewing it and uh, see whatever is put on your device. This. By doing this, you can look at applications built by banks, governments, Fortune 500 companies, game companies, et cetera. Um, and also, if they do have insecure coding practices in their code, um, you can learn to, and you understand that, you can exploit them. You can also learn about the backend systems based on how they interact with those systems. Um, if there's an underlying issue with the VM or a language, um, they'll give you ideas on how to approach exploiting it, uh, but it is also protectable. You can uh, protect against it, right? So, um, yeah, so let's uh, uh, take a look at decompiling a particular uh, application. We'll do a small one starting off, right? 
So what we're going to do is download an APK. So I got this website and what I'm going to use to uh, uh, get an APK. However, um, you can do it however you want because once you, uh, um, once you download an APK onto your phone, you can basically, uh, um, you have it on your phone. So you don't necessarily have to uh, use this URL, right? So let us find a small uh, system, uh, APK to decompile. Let's find a simple APK. Do you guys think of anything? Flashlight APK, right? So let's see how this works. So what you can do in order to protect against this is you can actually um, uh, use cryptography and like encrypt the actual code after you built it. So then in that case, you will uh, be unable to actually uh, see what's going on, right? So, because it'll it'll make it more difficult for APKs to do their work. So we've downloaded an APK, but if you have any URL for on Google app, uh, Google uh, Play Store, you can actually just put it here in the URL in the slide, and it'll download for you, right? So okay, so let's go to a decompiler. So I have the link to a decompiler here. So Java decompilers, you can use whatever you want. I'm just using an online one, but these programs could actually be downloaded and uh, um, used on your own computer. But I'm just using an uh, online one for now. So downloads. So we're gonna upload it and we're gonna decompile it and take a look at what's going on. It's a small file, so I don't think it'll take long. But in the meantime, we'll take a look at something else I decompiled a little bit, actually. Has anyone ever uh, actually gone and in, uh, uh, used a decompiler to find, uh, to find out something interesting about a program uh, that they didn't realize was happening before? So the flashlight, uh, APK decompiled and here are the Java files, right? We could download it, but I'm not gonna download it right now. So if we go and look at the sources, I don't think they've uh, encrypted this. Actually, they might have. So we can see that uh, the libraries, I don't know Android, but uh, so I don't do iPhone development, but uh, this doesn't seem right. So I'm assuming that they're using some sort of encryption to hide the code. Uh, I might be wrong though. So let's take a bit closer look at the stuff in here. So we go in, common. So now we'll be able to see some Java files. And as you can see here, they've encrypted it. So we're not gonna get that much in um, useful information from it, right? So we know they're using a thread, but something else is happening here because the actual names of the functions are uh, um, changed, right? Because I doubt that anyone's actually gonna write a program that has a class name called C0903D. So that's a form of uh, encryption to make it more difficult for people that are interested in uh, uh, learning how the code works uh, to understand it, right? But a lot of times when you deal with uh, companies that are new um, or not that big, right? Uh, they're not gonna encrypt their actual programs because they're not aware of it. But yeah, so by doing this and using a decompiler, you will be able to actually look at the code in many cases of uh, systems. But the protection against that is um, uh, using a, a crypt, something to encrypt it. Another thing that I uh, uh, looked at a little bit earlier that might be kind of cool is um, TD Bank's um, uh, code. So they're also using a encryptor, I believe, but uh, you can sort of get some information. They might be using Kotlin 
in order to double up things. But yeah, you can just play around with it and look at the different uh, systems that people are um, looking at the different uh, code bases and how people are programming and learn about whether they're like gathering information about you, right? So yeah, so that's a decompiler. And so this way you can reuse code and learn about other people's practices. Uh, so we just tried it out, right? So the steps are on the slides. I'll make them available uh, later. So now hex editors. So hex editors are an interesting thing because it gives you the ability to actually look at code uh, that's stored on your drive. So for example, uh, let's look at this program. So there's a website called hackthesite.com uh, or .org and it has a bunch of exercises that will actually introduce you to the different, uh, uh, it'll walk you through different exercises and challenges in order to uh, learn about hacking, right? A lot of times when you're trying to learn about something, it's uh, it's hard to find high quality resources will cut, that will cut out the fat because even the accredited programs, I find that they uh, jump around the stuff and go more to theoretical, but they have a couple of missions so that you can go through in order to sort of get exposure to different things like JavaScript hacking or application real estate uh, missions, uh, CTFs, they capture the flags and uh, more. Right, so it's, this is a good site, and there are other sites like this. Um, it's good if you have the time, and especially if you're in this field, to go through this stuff. But today we're going to actually be looking at a couple of activities, which will give us exposure to uh, using a hex editor. So in this case, we're using an application. Right, this program requires a password in order to uh, get into it. So we're going to authenticate. And unfortunately, we don't have uh, a correct uh, serial number. So now we had to figure it out. So by using a hex editor, the hex editor I'm using today is Hex Workshop. Uh, but you can use whichever one you like. You can right click on it. You can open it up and see the actual data, the ones and zeros that are stored on the drive. So what we're going to try and do now is find where, um, find any clues about the program that uh, might actually give us a serial or a way to uh, just identify how to get through it, right? So uh, I'm going to press Control F and uh, look for Authorize because I believe the actual button that we clicked was Authorize, right? Authenticate. So sorry. So in this case, Okay, so we go through the code, and as um, was said before, a string literals are stored on the drive. So now we could actually look at the um, actual text that was stored, because this converts into some of the actual data will be stored as um, text. So on the left, we see the ones and zeros, uh, which are grouped into hexadecimals. So that's why hexadecimal is basically another numbering system, right? So we have one. We have uh, different ways of counting, and um, this is another way of uh, basically grouping large amount of numbers into um, a smaller space. So this is so it's easier to look at for people. But these numbers on the left translate into the data on the right. So we see over here there are a couple of uh, numbers. Right, a number of numeric strings, and they look like a serial. So just by copying this, let's see if this will work. So we'll control copy it, and then we'll enter it over here. Authenticate. So we passed level one. So basically, by looking at the actual data that's stored on the drive, we're able to get a um, a serial number. So that was the first time. So, but in reality, uh, it's very less likely that the code. Um, that you're dealing with or application is going to store it these days in the actual file, right? Because anything on your computer, you have ultimate control over uh, versus uh, stuff on certain that distributes uh, the processing between the server and client the servers that are under control, the actual company that created software will have more control over those processes. So let's look at the next exercise. 
So it's the same thing, but it's using serials in a different way. And we're once again going to use um, uh, this in order to, a uh, hex editor, in order to figure out the serial. But I already know, because I've done this before, that it's stored in a different way. Okay, so now we have to find out based on this data, what the serial is. Does anyone want to take a shot at it? And I'll just uh, 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 do what you say. Because right now I'm just doing it. You'll learn by doing. Give it a shot. Who wants to uh, try? Anyone? Want to take a gander? No? OK. So what we're going to do now is um, look for authenticate again, because chances are near that button, uh, there might be clues as to what's happening, right? Or near that data. So we're going to search for authenticate. OK. So here it's a little bit different. When we look through this data, we see the following. We see a get to this uh, website. So let's see what happens here. So we see hackthesite.org and we see the get uh, statement. So what a get is, is basically a type of um, a way to send data or requests. So whenever you enter data in your uh, URL to access a website, Oftentimes, it uh, it is um, so that's a get statement in order to uh, retrieve information for a website. So we put in that URL because the URL was basically in the code, and we get a list of uh, serials. So technically, this should work. If SSL doesn't get in the way, I think it is going to get in the way, um, but. Uh, we could just open up this file, put in one of the serials, and then authenticate. Hmm. Okay, so something happened. And I think it's because Okay, so let's see what happened here. That is valid authenticator software. So usually this would work, but the thing is, the problem currently is that this website and a lot of these activities were built before SSL existed. So uh, what's happening is that it's trying to make a request to hack the site.org. However, it is getting intercepted. So, because it's redirecting us from the HTTP site to the HTTPS site. So we can actually get a better look at what's happening by using a tool called Wireshark. So what Wireshark does is look at the actual data that is passed over our network and uh, uh, will actually Tell us what's going on. So, I'm going to make a request. I stop it, see what happened. I'll filter on HTTP requests. This was our request. So by using a filter, I was able to narrow down on the actual code that made the request. So as you can see here, it's returning a uh, 301 moved uh, permanently. So here's the issue. So I'm not going to get into this now because I haven't dealt with it yet. But if you would like to actually see how it's done, I have a video of it uh, on my YouTube channel. And this was pre-SSL being implemented. So. I'll post an update to it with the um, without SSL. Does anyone could anyone think of on the spot on how to get around that? One thing I would do, but I don't have this set up, is I would set up a 
I would modify the, I would set up a local web server and there's a file called uh, HTT, um, our host file, right? Over here. So what we can do is um, redirect requests to particular websites by, so I, was, I started doing it, but I didn't get it done. So basically um, whenever someone goes to a particular URL, like hackthesite.org, it, we can say, instead of going to that website, go to our local computer. And then if I had a web server running, which I don't, um, I could actually post that data in particular on um, or whatever data I wanted to send back on that URL on my local host. So rather than it going and retrieving information from um, the place where it's supposed to go, because we modified the host site, um, the host the file, it'll go to our local web server, uh, be redirected, and um, that way it'll pull the data that we wanted. So I, I don't know if you guys ever used a crack or anything before in order to gain access to like something like Photoshop uh, that you downloaded. Uh, not that I have, but if you do, you'll notice that it uh, actually modifies the host files and it'll add entries in it. And that's because when it's going to check um, the server for re valid registration keys or valid registration information, they're actually redirecting that request or blocking that request using the host file, which is basically domain to IP mappings uh, from going through. And in that way, you can actually trick the actual program that is on your computer into thinking that, uh, uh, into getting that information from another server, and then it'll act as if it's registered rather than uh, uh, not allowing you to have access to all the functionality. So yeah, that's hex editors for you. Um, another thing you can do is put a proxy in between it. Uh, I don't have that set up on this computer. It's a new computer as well. Um, but yeah, that, that's, that's uh, basically it. So that was what I planned uh, to talk about today, right? So. Um, Hi, Neilan. Yep, go on. Uh, sorry, it's Jesse again with another question. Um, mm -hmm. When we were looking at the hex editors, uh, and, and I know you had talked about uh, the fact that the APK or the executable file has strings embedded right in it. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we when we look at the third column here, like the strings are clearly called out, but there's a whole bunch of periods which are clearly not like at least looking at the hex it's like every period would not be equivalent to another period is that just like um is that yeah. just undecipherable code that that hex doesn't understand or what, what um that's so whenever you have a program that you compile it converts into something called machine code which and this code is something that the computer can understand right yeah. uh, but people can't understand so the stuff that isn't strings is oftentimes uh, uh, hidden within these dots. Uh, the stuff that is clear is over here. Sometimes you can make it out, but not always, right? Uh, so see these this information on the left? Yep. Um, that's actually, these numbers on the left are actually translating into these letters and these dots, but the dots are basically code. Um, as long as not a double zero, the dots are like uh, information that the program uses and is read into the actual system to be run. Right. So would you say that's like a new line character or, or a carriage return, something like that? Um, it depends on the number, right? Uh, I don't know it off the top of my head. Maybe someone does, but it's, it's basically ones and zeros. How does that make sense? So if you look at converting hexadecimal into regular binary, uh, So there are different ways of writing numbers, right? Our regular uh, counting system is called base 10. And if we go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10. And that's what we were growing up, we uh, grew up with. And that's how we usually count. But there are actually different ways of counting. Um, uh, and uh, binary and hexadecimal are different ways of displaying numbers, right? So when uh, you have a base 10, you have like, uh, so essentially these numbers that you write in binary 
over here. So binary only has ones and zeros, right? It'll translate into like a 55 because hexadecimal has numbers and letters. I'm trying to think of an easy way to describe it off the top of my head. Our, our base 10 system has basically 10 numbers and then they repeat as we go into the high, like, uh, like uh, beyond 10, right? So we'll have one, two, it has nine numbers. And then we, once we go, uh, 10 numbers, sorry. So it has zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then we go into like, uh, and then we go into 10, which is a one and a zero. And that's how it increments more, right? So there are different ways of counting. So we have like base 11, base, uh, uh, I, I guess a binary would be like uh, base, what would it be? Two, uh, base one, I guess. No, I might have gotten it wrong, but does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I think you, it, it's base 16 or something, right? Um, yeah. Just share the link on the chat, um, Jesse. Probably you can just have a look at it when you're free. Okay. Yeah, so there's hex editor. So if you ever, you're interested in learning about that stuff, right? It's all on the net. So this is just exposure, but if you really want to learn about things in depth, you have to go and do stuff with it, right? Because that's the best way to learn. Um, yeah, I think uh, like my question was more like, uh, I, I know how hex works roughly. Like uh, I think the, uh, the, the letter versions substitute for a certain amount or certain, certain numerical values, right? Like F for example, but it only goes up to F, not H or G, I think the way the system works. I was just curious because like each one of these dots might represent a different hex thing. I was just trying to figure so, out why the hex editor. So what uh, Arvin said is that non-printable ASCII characters and characters that would take more than one character space like tab are typically represented by a dot in the following okay. ASCII fields. So there, they do represent information, uh, but uh, um, they're, they're not displayed, right? So like, um, so a, a dot that is actually nothing is zero, zero. But then if it is not zero, zero, it's actually ASCII character that can't be displayed. Right. Right. Um, and another cool thing about, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. Okay. And another cool thing about this is that uh, if we look over here, we can actually change this program by editing the code in the hex editor, right? So if we look for that uh, string, that's authenticate. Okay. So we can actually uh, go in here and let's, uh, let's make it a uh, misspelling like AB authenticate, right? So we can file save that executable. Change its name. Now, when we open it up, we see we actually changed what is displayed there. So you can make modifications like that. Of course, it's a little bit more complicated because you don't than that. However, just knowing that you can do that, for example, if there's a if statement in the code that you can actually decipher and uh, um, you can switch the, the true and the false uh, conditions, right? So if it evaluates the true or false, you can swap them and then you can make it work uh, for the negative condition, right? which might be useful if you're trying to uh, get past um, a security constraint, right? right? Or get access to something that you didn't have access to before. So that's uh, something that's interesting to uh, know as well. Um, does anyone else have uh, anything they want to discuss? Um, I had a question. Okay, go for it. So you talked about like the periods. Um, um, could, could that also mean we could decipher like, I know the program is let's say written in Python or maybe another language like C or C sharp. And then- um, Well, there are compiled languages and uncompiled languages. The thing about Python, if uh -huh. you're looking at Python code, it's not gonna be compiled ahead of time, right? 
So okay. it goes on the fly. So usually when you're looking at a uh, Python program, you can actually mm -hmm. just look at the files. But for something like C or C sharp, they compile mm -hmm. it ahead of time. So then you would have to use a decompiler or something to look at the code because it's not readily available uh, to look at. Okay. So let's say you have com compiled it down to like assembly code. So would you be able to figure out the assembly language instructions from just looking at the hex file? Um, I think that there are programs that would decompile it to assembly. I'm not sure, but okay. I, I think I've seen it previously. Um, I might have seen it in the past, um, but uh, there should be, right? Uh, I, I don't know about, does anyone else know about that off the top of their head? A decompile that would decompile it into assembly? Because assembly is the next thing to machine language, right? So it'd probably be easier to decompile it to assembly uh, okay. than to the actual language. So, I believe .NET has a, like a Visual Studios has a built-in uh, attachment that you can actually look at like uh, the assembly within DLLs and stuff like that. So that's, that's okay. what I like about um, uh, Visual Studios. You can actually decompile stuff from within the system. So you don't have to download separate programs. A lot of that functionality is already there, but I've noticed in many cases people don't use it. Um, in fact, I've never seen, uh, like, uh, usually people will buy, buy third party tools for something that's already provided within the actual, um, um, uh, environment. So, yeah, so, so things like dot peak actually just show the, the intermediate language they don't show the actual assembly the uh, is, is generated, uh, like it's jitted. So it's, it's only in memory. It's only in memory. Oh. Yeah. So uh, C sharp is it's like a two stage compile like Java. So C sharp gets compiled into um, MSIO, which is like their bytecode, and that's what the disassembler will show. And then that's loaded by the runtime, and in memory is compiled to like native uh, machine language. Okay, and bytecode looks a lot like uh, missile looks a lot like assembly, right? It does, yeah. It's a, it's a stack based language, so it's a little weird looking, like the way that it works. But it's it is it's similar to assembly, yeah. If you were uh, if you were decompiling to assembly, though, like wouldn't it be just like uh, expanding the difficulty to try and hack something by like orders of magnitude, just because actually reading through assembly and trying to figure out what classes or functions are doing on the small scale like would be impossible or it would be a lot more code i wouldn't say impossible but just like it would take a lot more time to go through the code so that's why they're higher level languages so the higher level languages um basically compensate without you having to actually um, compensate for things you have to write out redundantly um or redundantly build out um by doing it for you uh, so like, uh, for example, if you're using something like C-sharp or Java, their benefit was that uh, prior to them, oftentimes, or even prior to C++, um, if you were writing code for a particular type of system, uh, like a Mac versus a, a PC, it, would, it wouldn't be able, you'd have to write separate code for both systems, right? Um, but with these higher level languages, uh, because they're running on something called a virtual machine, um, it, uh, um, it allows you to take that code and run it either on a Mac or a PC. So you don't actually have to worry about writing a separate code. So that means less maintenance and less uh, costs. Furthermore, um, because they compensate for a lot of the things that you would have to plan for before, uh, like memory management, uh, that also means you have to write less code and worry about less, right? Because you have uh, less room for making uh, errors. Like with C, um, which was a lower level language uh, back in the day that is still used, but not so much anymore, I wouldn't think. Uh, you have insecure procedures. So what that means is that they would have functions that uh, if used, allow you to gain access or do things you shouldn't be able to do, like uh, buffer overflow. So you can actually execute things outside 
um, um, of what was supposed to be done. You can make the code behave in a way you didn't want to uh, behave, or you can gain, you could do a, a privilege escalation because some of the code, some of the functions in order to execute uh, would require uh, higher privileges. And if you ran uh, your um, malicious code in that, uh, uh, that period of uh, uh, privilege escalation, like taking advantage of that functionality, you'd be able to do things that uh, uh, you shouldn't be able to do. So you can, you could exploit it, things like that. So a higher level languages, in my opinion, uh, tend to be better unless you're writing for speed, but uh, you, you're worried about like power and uh, speed. But in most cases, especially like here, um, where that's abundant, uh, for most applications, that's not necessarily a priority, right? Because if poorly written code is going to, um, it's going to uh, um, not have those speed benefits and stuff. Like uh, very few people, I would think, uh, can build a large program very optimized uh, without issues um, uh, more efficiently than using a higher level language in order to do the same thing, right? The benefits are negligible because it will cost. It will take longer as well as uh, um, require more maintenance and uh, uh, be harder a harder language to deal with on that scale. Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess uh, what I was getting at was like if if like for me if I'm developing an application, if I'm actually going to worry about someone hacking it on the assembly level. Like I'm guessing that would take considerably more time and resources from the hacker to spend time on it that like I could go and release another version and just they'd have to start over from scratch. But I don't know if that's a correct way to think about it. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that's an issue. You probably heard of like uh, Java vulnerabilities and stuff found, right? I'd say that uh, in general, it's easier to uh, code written on a lower level language uh, has more ability to like using like writing something out in assembly or writing something out with uh, C. You have more potential to create security vulnerabilities that way than using uh, something that's higher level that's pre-built, right? Oh, uh, the, okay. reason, the reason why there is so much um, publicity about these higher level languages and stuff is because when a vulnerability does occur, so many people are using it that um, it, the word spreads faster, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean as that um, it's more vulnerable. It's just that the vulnerability is more known, right? But if yeah. you were to create something with assembly and stuff, it would be, um, you'd have more uh, potential for introducing those issues. So um, having something hacked at the assembly level, um, I, I don't think you should be worried about that when building out like uh, your company or anything. Because if you overthink security, it'll uh, um, you can worry about that later. You know what I mean? Or yeah. have someone uh, look at that. Because uh, if you pay too much attention to it and get too paranoid, you're just going to get paralyzed, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Oh, that was uh, that was a really good answer. Thank you. That makes sense. I hadn't thought about it like that. Yeah, and it's not it's not uh, like a, a very few people. Uh, unless they're targeting you in particular, are actually going to uh, go to that level of uh, effort in order to uh, uh, specifically destroy your uh, little program, right? So, um, anyone else? Does anyone want to share stuff uh, that, like, uh, um, uh, things that they thought of or things that they've done with relation to application hacking that uh, um, uh, could benefit others? Feel free to uh, speak up. Anybody? Um, hi, this is Arvan again. Um, hey, Arvan. Yeah, there are some um, basic videos using Burp on uh, how to kind of hack an application, right? So those are something which are interesting and like anyone who wanted to kind of have a, a basic understanding of how, how a web application hacking happens, it's a good kind of starter and you can kind of develop yourself from there on itself. Oh, okay, that's cool. So hack this site also has exercises in order to, I'm wondering if they're a little bit old because some of them seem to be broken. However, they have application missions for hacking older uh, languages. That's uh, web languages, right? 
uh, like JavaScript hacking. Um, realistic missions goes more into web development. Uh, another thing that you could do is uh, use WebGo. So that's uh, a web server. So it shows you how to exploit an insecure um, web application server. And, there, and, and these days, there are so many resources out there, especially with the advent of like Pluralsight and stuff. Um, it's, uh, it's very easy to um, get lost in all the information. But I found a good starting point really is hack the site in order to learn about the basics. Uh, sure, some things are broken, but they have forms that you can ask questions on uh, if you do have uh, issues. So if there is uh, something that broke, uh, other people will mention it and uh, they'll have a workaround, right? Um, what else? Okay, I guess that's all. So like um, I do do courses online. So if you're interested in like uh, learning about rapid web development with .NET Core and stuff, I have it on my YouTube channel, Fresh Code Soda. Uh, I also have it on Udemy if you're interested. Um, so on Udemy, I have uh, .NET Core. I, I, I'll send it out afterwards. So it, it basically, you can build an application that I've seen taking a lot of people like a couple of days to build up in, uh, in less than like 10 minutes. It's, it's a way to rapidly generate uh, uh, form-based applications. Um, and especially if you're an accountant or uh, you're in anything that requires data entry, that could save you a lot of time, right? Uh, just by knowing how to uh, do it. So yeah, that's all for now. Uh, uh, we'll continue to have these uh, meetups. If you're interested in giving like a, um, a meetup on like a, how to use Burp Suite and stuff like that, that would be awesome, right? So feel free to reach out. I'll keep in touch, right? So I'll call it an end. Does anyone else want to introduce themselves or speak up? Any last words? Uh, I, if, I don't mean to make us run over time, but I have one no. more question that I'd be curious for your opinion on. Um, okay. I'm at home right now, so I'm fine. <laughs> okay. Um, when we were looking at the hex editor, um, it kind of, it's kind of like surprising that like the only, like we took, we looked at cryptography, certain things being encrypted or, or changed made more hard to read or hack or understand in the source code. Um, and it's kind of surprising that you can open up a hex editor and see like certain strings like authenticate come through. And I'm just curious about your opinion. Like if this is uh if this is such a common way to open up an APK or something and see, like go straight to like the authenticate button and see and start to investigate how that's working. Like why would the strings themselves that are embedded in this program not be encrypted using some kind of algorithm? Because it seems weird that like the only things that would come through would be the strings and why didn't they encrypt those? Do you know what I mean? Um, because in this particular language, um, the strings are stored uh, somewhere else. Uh, does that make sense? So they, they actually store like the text and stuff in something like a, a, a certain portion of memory that's stored. It's, it's called Real Basic, the program that this was uh, built in. Every programming language when it uh, compiles will arrange the data differently. But uh, oftentimes in order to run a program, regardless, you're gonna have to put it in memory and it's not gonna be encrypted when you're running it in memory. So like, uh, then you'll be uh, able to take a little bit better of a look, right? Uh, does that make sense? So yeah. they, they don't encrypt everything oftentimes. So like even with encrypted APKs and stuff like that, when they're running it, um, they're gonna have to decompile it at some point in order to run it. And then you'll be able to take a good look at, a little bit better look at it. Not through these programs, but there are other programs out there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so no more questions for me. Just thank you for putting on the meetup. It was very interesting. Oh, okay. That's cool. Yeah. I'm looking for other people to host a meetup. Uh, I'm, I'm actually interested in learning what you guys know uh, as well. Right. Uh, also, I, I'm a bit disappointed. Uh, com like the organization Hack Canada uh, closed down. They used to be, they used to uh, have very interesting stuff. 
but uh, yeah, they're no longer here. So if you go to their website, it's down, but you can go to the cache and see what they had. They had some pretty cool like uh, um, projects that they worked on that were atypical, right? But yeah, so if anyone's working on anything or uh, has an interesting project going on or hears about anything, feel free to give a meetup or like uh, hit me up about that, right? Um, uh, it's been a uh, pleasure. Uh, nice uh, uh, meeting you guys. I'll be holding other uh, uh, meetups with regards to like uh, introductory courses, uh, like uh, with regards to web development as well as programming and uh, databases eventually as well. So um, nice, uh, um, nice meeting you guys. Have a great day. Uh, remember to, even though you might be at home uh, from COVID because of the quarantine, Take advantage to spend more time with your family and look at the benefits of it. Uh, exercise. It's a perfect opportunity to get into better shape. Uh, like uh, do insanity, those home workouts and stuff. Uh, don't let your uh, uh, physique go to waste, right? You can get into the best shape of your life, go for jogs and stuff. Uh, another thing you can do is learn how to cook, right? Always learn. So yeah, it's been a pleasure. I will check out the chat. Okay. Um, and that's it for now. Oh, so I'll copy these. Have a great weekend, guys. Take care. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.